Uh, so yeah, well, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, session where I'm going to talk about some of the lessons I've learned from uh, running several apps and projects in production. Um, so my name is Yan. I've been the serverless hero, and uh, I've been a long time AWS user as well. So nowadays I spend, I would say, half of my time working with Lumigo as a developer advocate. And Lumigo is a very really powerful troubleshooting platform for serverless applications. And the other half of my time, I work as an independent consultant where I help other companies uh, succeed with uh, serverless. And in my capacity as a consultant, I've worked on a couple of uh, projects with AppSync in the last uh, 18 months across uh, several industries. I built a social network, a healthcare app, and a uh, document assembly system as well, all interesting in the, their own way, and they all have some B2B and the multi-tenancy requirements. As you can see, all three of these projects were fairly large, as you can tell from the number of resolvers in those AppSync APIs. The stack for these uh, projects were pretty much consistent. Um, they were mostly AppSync, Lambda, and DynamoDB. And I've also used the Cognito and of zero for authentication. And for search, Algolia is my preferred choice. But for the healthcare app, because of HIPAA requirements, we actually settled for Amazon Elasticsearch instead. And for all three of these projects, I used the Lumigo to help me debug and troubleshoot the app. And uh, here are seven of the lessons that I've learned in the time that I've been working with AppSync. The first and arguably the most important lesson is that uh, you should use uh, Lambda resolvers only as a last resort. Because AppSync lets you write resolvers that reads and writes data to DynamoDB using VTL templates, where you say what operation you want to do and the parameters that you want to use. VTL is not the most easy to use uh, programming language, but honestly, you don't have to write a lot of VTL code. Most of the time, you're just writing a JSON object that describes the DynamoDB operation that you want to do. But of course, sometimes you do still need to stick a Lambda function in there so that you can implement more complex business logic and uh, or maybe you're calling some third-party service using their own SDKs. Or maybe you want to use the built-in retry and the exponential backoff that AWS SDK gives you for better resilience for your application. Or maybe you want to implement circuit breakers or fallbacks or other patterns in case there's some problems with the DynamoDB service itself so that you can degrade your experience, um, your user experience more gracefully. Or maybe you just need to do more than one thing, right? Like getting an item from DynamoDB and then you do some updates and then you save the changes back to the table. Um, the last one you can also do using pipeline resolvers as well, if you really want to avoid having to add the Lambda function in there, because adding a Lambda function into the mix adds another source for latency for your resolvers, especially when you consider the fact that you are going to see some cold starts from time to time, even if the traffic in production usually keeps the functions themselves warm so that it's not really as bad as uh, some people make it out to be. Uh, but when you have nested resolvers, those uh, Lambda cold starts can start to stack up, and that's where things get a bit ugly. And it's also another thing that you also have to pay for as well, for both the Lambda invocation requests, as well as for the amount of time that your function runs for, most of which is probably just waiting for some requests to finish uh, for I.O. So you, you know, you're paying for idle time for those uh, functions. And you have to worry about the regional concurrency execution limit, which uh, applies to all the functions in the region, including those that are not part of your AppSync API. So is it possible that some other functions may be consuming too much of the concurrency so that the, your API functions start to get throttled? So all in all, I think for simple CRUD operations, you just shouldn't use the Lambda resolvers. And instead, you should go straight to DynamDB from AppSync your template because it's just cheaper, it's faster, I think it's more scalable as well. And I think it's also simpler because uh, I don't have to write and uh, configure another Lambda function and all the things that come with that, including setting up IAM roles and, uh, set and so on and so forth. Um, but quite a few people have actually told me that they don't like this approach because they end up writing a lot of VTL code and it's not their cup of tea. Now, this, uh, this kind of stumped me a little bit at first because um, it's just a complete opposite to my personal experience. 
Uh, but it turns out everyone who's complained about the amount of BTL code they have to write were using single table designs with DynamoDB, which brings me to the next point that you really don't need to use single table designs at least most of the time. As much as it's considered best practice for Amazon, because at their scale, it makes perfect sense. But for almost everybody else, it's probably going to be overkill and it's going to do more harm than good. And in case you haven't heard about single table design, it's a collection of practices and modeling techniques that solve the problem of data joining when you're using DynamoDB by pre-joining the data into collections into a single table. So imagine you have a um, users table and an orders table, and you want to build a page that shows the user profile along with the user's orders. So you have to make a get item request to the users table to get the user profile. And then you have to make a query request to the orders table to get the orders that belong to this user. So that's two separate DynamoDB requests. Whereas uh, if you were to put both the users and the orders into a single table and you use some clever schema to squeeze both the user IDs and the order IDs into opaque um, primary keys and sort keys or PK and, and SKs, then what you can do is you can use one DynamDB query to get both the user and the orders by looking for the, uh, the primary key user number one. And the sort key is either going to be the string user or it starts with order hash and so you can get both the user and his orders in one request. And after you get the response back, then you can uh, you can split the data uh, in your own code into the user and the orders, which if you think about it, it's pretty clever, right? And there are lots of other patterns here that can help you model one-to-many and the many-to-many -many relationships uh, within the same table. But the fact that it's clever also means that there's a bit of learning curve to it, especially for people who are brand new to DynamoDB. And it's generally speaking, not a great idea for greenfield projects because once you've modeled all of these access patterns into your schema, it's not easy to change those uh, access patterns. And it can also be difficult to add new access patterns as well. And when you have one table for every entry, so sorry, every entity, you also have the option to say, use a cost tags to track the cost for each table and monitor the usage cost by entity. You can't do that with a single table design because all the data access is going to one table. And if you want to use the DynamoDB streams, then it also becomes really difficult to use when you have a single table design because well, you're going to get every data change event in one stream. And since uh, DynamoDB streams doesn't have any built-in filtering, you have to do that in your own code if you're only interested in events related to, say, users or related to orders. And then you've got to worry about having this limit of five subscribers per stream, which really puts a dent on how much you can do with DynamoDB streams. And the funny thing is, this issue of data joining is basically a non-issue when it comes to GraphQL and AppSync because the users and the orders can be handled by two separate resolvers. Each are going to fetch the data from different DynamDB table and AppSync is going to join the data together for you for the response it sends back to the caller. So you really don't have to do too much yourself in, in terms of the data joining. And that being said, I do think you should learn about single table design and understand the techniques um, that, that comes with it so you can use them where they make sense. And in some cases, you do want to aggregate entities into a single table because they're always being fetched together, for example. But just don't go around making a religion out of single table designs and literally put all of your data into a single table because that's going to make your life a lot more difficult than it needs to be. And when you use uh, single table designs with AppSync, you do end up writing a lot more custom VTL code because you have to construct those uh, um, those special um, PKs and SKs and having to split the data in the response template as well. So um, you do end up having to write quite a lot more custom logic in VTL. Um, other because for S uh, single table design might say that, yeah, but no, that's that's worth it because of all the cost savings. Uh, fetching multiple entities with a single query is cheaper than multiple get item requests to different tables, which is true. But the cost savings 
they tend to only amount to a very small amount and nowhere near the amount that's even worth thinking about when uh, when you consider the fact that, uh, sure, for Amazon, running at millions of requests per second, you know, those cost saving is going to be huge. But, and it absolutely makes sense. But for most of the applications out there, the cost of the engineering time that is going to have to add to work with a single table design is going to far outweigh whatever saving you're going to make from the dynamic DB costs. And besides, if you're really concerned about the cost for dynamic DB, then caching is a much better strategy to save on that cost. In one of our recent projects, we managed to get 99% cache hit rate for our API, and they cut our dynamic DB cost to just a few dollars after we launched the app and pretty much went straight to 25,000 monthly active users. And our cost was pretty low when it comes to DynamDB and Lambda because of caching. Another nice side effect of caching is that it made the API pretty fast. Our 99 percentile latency was consistently below 200 milliseconds, and the client was really happy about that. So speaking about caching, AppSync supports two different modes of caching. You can either have uh, full request caching or per resolver caching. And I think you should pretty much always go with uh, per resolver caching. So imagine you have this uh, GraphQL request to fetch your timeline from Twitter. With full request caching, AppSync is going to cache the response against this whole request. And it's going to use the context arguments and the identity as the cache key. And this is not actually going to get you very far at all in terms of having a good cache hit rate. And for example, a user's profile is going to show up in many of the tweets, and uh, uh, he's going to show up in many of user many people's uh, um, timelines as well. And even though the user's profile probably hasn't changed for years, like mine, and but we're still going to have to fetch it from the database. And many, many times, every time a different user fetches his timeline or this user's tweet on a different page. Similarly, the tweet that the profile shows up in is also going to show up in many people's timelines as well. And um, each user is going to fetch the same data from the database, which is just really inefficient. With per resolver caching, we can enable caching for individual resolvers, and we can choose what's included in the cache key and also what TTL to use. So we can, in this case, choose to use the profile ID as a cache key. And so after the first user fetches the, his timeline and sees his profile, every other user who uh, gets this tweet and gets this profile is going to get the data from the cache instead until the TTL expires, which is far more efficient. So in general, you want to cache data that doesn't change often and cache them for everybody. And uh, doing this is going to be an important part of a good caching strategy that has a, that has a high cache hit ratio. But one thing to also keep in mind is that uh, um, even though it's possible in AppSync to flush the cache, it's an all or nothing. So you can't, ca you can't flush individual items in the cache. You have to flush the whole thing. And also, when you enable caching, every um, virtual machine, every EC2 node in the app sync fleet for your API have to maintain a persistent connection to the underlying Redis node that you don't see, but it's still going to be there. And uh, establishing this uh, connection pooling has a latency overhead, which you might notice from time to time, which in my experience, when it happens, adds about two seconds to the request latency. So if you have uh, X-ray enabled, then you may see this uh, um, this this time, uh, which unfortunately is not labeled when you look at the X-ray trace. But it's basically this massive gap you see here, where it looks like nothing is happening. But what's happening under the hood is that the AppSync node is uh, creating a connection pool uh, for the the, the the that is is running behind the scenes. And uh, okay, so on to lesson number four. Uh, don't leave the logging setting on full when you go to production because it's going to get expensive really, really quickly. So if you go to the logging session in the AppSync uh, settings page, you can set the field resolver log level between none, error, and all. And the problem here is that these choices are basically having nothing, close to nothing, or having logging down to 11. Because when you have um, the log level set to all, it gives you so much logs, including the input and output for every resolver and how much time the resolver took, which is great for debugging, by the way, but also gets it really expensive really quickly because all those data are going to CloudWatch logs and it's being charged at the 50 cents per gigabyte of data ingested. So 
you definitely don't want to leave the field resolver log level at all when you go to production because the cost of those logs in CloudWatch is going to be prohibitive. But if you're like me and you want to have the cake and eat it too, uh, then check out this blog, which explains the workaround that I use, where I use a pair of cron jobs to change the resolver log level between error and all. So I get about three minutes worth of uh, detailed logs for every hour. Not a great workaround, but it's the best I can think of right now until something more official comes out for AppSync. And uh, lesson number five, if you don't get, if you don't want to get woken up in the middle of the night uh, by false alarms, then the, you also need to think about how you handle user errors more gracefully. See, HTTP has got 400 status codes to represent user errors and the 500 status codes to represent the system errors. And if our system is not working, then we want to be alerted so we can fix it quickly. On the other hand, if users are making mistakes and sending bad data, then it's something that we want to keep an eye on because maybe our UX is just bad and making users do silly things, but it's also not something that we need to deal with urgently. And we definitely don't want to get woken up at 3 a.m. in the morning uh, just to be just find out there's some the 400 errors. So when you're building REST APIs with API Gateway and Lambda, you can do your validation and then return a 400 error as a response. So the Lambda invocation was successful but it lets us tell API Gateway to respond to the request with a 400 error. With AppSync, unfortunately, there's no way for us to tell AppSync to return a 400 error from a Lambda resolver. If we detect some user error, we can all we can do is to throw some exception, which uh, AppSync is going to capture and include in the, um, in the response as an error. Uh, but this is going to fail the Lambda invocation as well. And that's going to trigger any alerts we have on Lambda invocation error metric, which we should have, because we do want to find out when our function is not working. So what you can do instead is to return a payload that captures the error information that you want to return, and then write a custom VTL response template to check if the resolver result includes an error object. And if so, throw an error here in the template, so but not in the Lambda, um, but not in the Lambda function. This way, the Lambda invocation is still successful, but we're able to then fail the resolver with an error that we can return to the caller. So moving on to lesson number six, you need to have a plan for when it happens when you hit the 500 resources limit in the cloud formation stack. Because an, a an AppSync API has a lot of resources. You have resolvers, data sources, you've got IAM roles, and then for Lambda resolvers, you also have the Lambda functions, which uh, should have its own IAM role, and it's also going to have its own CloudWatch log group. So very quickly, you can hit that 500 limit at some point, probably sooner than you think. Luckily, there is a solution for that, which is to use uh, nested stacks. And each nested stack can have up to 500 resources. So that significantly raises the ceiling for how many resources you can have in the project. And if you're using the serverless framework, there's a really handy plugin called the serverless plugin uh, split stacks, which can really help you here. The nice thing about it, uh, about this plugin is that you don't really need to change your project structure. The plugin would move the resources around into nested stacks and then update the references so that all of your existing ref and get attribute references still work as if everything is still in the same stack. But you need to take care and make sure that you don't create the circular references between resources in the root stack and resources in the nested stack. The plugin lets you write a custom script to decide to which um, stack the resources will go. So you can write a custom script to split the resources in a way that doesn't create the circular references. And in my current project, I was able to split my pretty gigantic stack uh, all into uh, over 50 nested stacks and still leave plenty of room for the project to continue to grow. So the last lesson is that uh, you want to think about modeling multi-tenant uh, with Cognito, as this seems to be a really common requirement for a lot of, uh, a lot of applications out there. So if you're building any sort of uh, B2B application, this is probably going to be relevant for you where you need to model having tenants and users, and users belong to a tenant, and uh, each user have different roles, which limits them to some subset of the operations that you support. So the simple way to do this to, uh, with a cognitive user pool is to use uh, groups to model the roles and then capture the tenant ID as a custom attribute. And then in your GraphQL schema, if you need to limit access to a specific operation, 
then you just can you can just add this decorator to the operation and you're done. AppSync is going to handle the rest. In this case, only users that are part of the uh, admin and super user group is able to call my add user mutation. And finally, to stop users from being able to access other tenants data, you should never accept tenant ID as an argument. So when you need to access some data for a user, always take the tenant ID from the context identity, which is the identity of the user which has been resolved and verified by Cognito. And that takes me to the end of this talk. I want to thank you guys again for being with us. And as I mentioned cool. earlier, I spend most of my time as an independent consultant. So if you want to need some, if you want to see how we can work together, go to theburningmont.com slash hire me uh, to see how I work. And check out my video course on AppSync at the appsyncmasterclass.com. And yeah, again, thank you guys so much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Hi, thanks, Jan, for the great um, lessons you had. Uh, especially the fact uh, about caching was very interesting for me. Uh, during your talk, we get a few questions from our audience. And so I would like to jump uh, to the Q&A. Okay, Let's start sure. with the first session. So the first session was about Cognito uh, versus uh, zero. So where, what are your pros and what are your cons and what are your use cases? Yeah, so I think Cognito has uh, got the advantage of being a, um, uh, I guess, uh, has got some built integration uh, with uh, AppSync and API Gateway. So it's quite easy to use, uh, but at the same time, uh, it doesn't have some of the more advanced features like MFA and the things like that out of the box. So it's something that you have to implement yourself. And that's kind of the advantage that the of zero has and other similar uh, tools like Okta have in terms of having that support for MFA. Um, but uh, off zero and other tools are also a lot more expensive compared to off zero. Uh, so compared to Cognito, and um, if you want to integrate with off zero with uh, between off zero and AppSync, uh, nowadays you can use the you can you can either use uh, some kind of uh, sample integration between Cognito and off zero. So your AppSync API is uh, authorized by Cognito, which then mm. sample federates the identity to of zero. Yeah. That's quite a yeah. common way to do that. Uh, but if you need to do sort of some kind of multi-tenancy group-based authentication, it might be easier to implement that using a custom Lambda authorizer for AppSync. Yeah, okay. Yeah, totally makes sense. Let's move on to the next question. So what about uh, authentication, authorization, data input, output validation in AppSync? Yeah, so that's one of the beauty of uh, GraphQL uh, is that uh, you get the, basically you get the data validation, at least a lot of it out of the box with the schema. So with API Gateway, you don't have um, uh, you don't have re response validation. You can do re uh, request validation for post endpoints, but with S uh, with uh, GraphQL, you, you know you've got your schema, and you literally cannot return data that is not on a schema. So now, now some of the examples we've seen in the past where uh, attackers steal the information from a system by tricking it to return data that is never supposed to be returned. Well, yeah. that's not going to happen because uh, you know, the schema says what can be returned and nothing else gets mm -hmm. returned. Um, so yeah. that really helps in terms of security. In terms of authentication and authorization, uh, AppSync has got integration with uh, a lot of different things. You've got Cognito, you've got the, anything that supports uh, OIDC, uh, and you also now have um, the, uh, the, you also have API key support as well, um, which is uh, not the first choice I would use because API keys expire after one year. So you got to think about how to do that. Um, yeah. So you, uh, and also you can use the, the Lambda authorizer now as well to integrate with um, uh, other systems like Off Zero and other and, or Okta or whatever you use. But yeah, input validation and output validation is so easy with AppSync. Yeah, cool. Totally makes sense what you're saying. Uh, one last question, maybe. Um, how do you test your AppSync VTL locally? Yeah, so for my VTL templates, uh, I use, so the Amplify um, library also publishes a few of its internal tools as open source projects. Um, so what I use is I use those libraries to basically uh, simulate uh, my uh, VTL template, uh, give it some input, and then check the output and make sure that uh, it's doing the right thing. Uh, and uh, I have uh, no, I've got a bunch of unit tests uh, for VTL templates that are more interesting. A lot of the time, my VTL templates are just, you know, here's the get item request to DynamDB, and here are the attributes. So I don't really need to unit test those because uh, I've got engine tests to cover those already. But where I'm doing something more custom, like I'm doing some uh, logic to populate the keys and to construct things or to split the results from a DynamDB request. 
then I'll write some unit tests for those. Um, check out my Epson Masterclass. I uh, actually got a lot of uh, um, lessons that show you how to do that step by step. Okay, cool. Um, maybe another question. So uh, do you have any downsides or limits of using direct integration? Um, so the main limit is going to be um, uh, the, the sort of AppSync's uh, uh, API request per second. I can't remember what the default is. I think it's, uh, I want to say it's about a thousand or a couple thousand requests per second. That is the main limit you got to think about. Uh, other than that, uh, you got to think about the limits on the service that you want to integrate with. So if you're doing direct integration between AppSync and DynamoDB, then the super limitations on that table is going to come into effect. Uh, but that's going to be a case of whether or not you're going from AppSync to DynamDB or you're going from AppSync to Lambda to DynamDB. Uh, just that when you have Lambda, you're going to have uh, another thing that's going to have a limit that you have to think about. So as much as possible, uh, avoid having a Lambda function if, uh, if you can. Sometimes you can't, but uh, yeah, a lot of simple cases, uh, just don't put a Lambda in there if you don't need to. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, maybe another question. So what's the best practice in uploading binaries like profile pictures with GraphQL, is it really S3 present URLs or what are you doing? Yeah, so for a lot of these sort of upload uh, uh, features, that I, what I have is I have got a query that returns the upload URL to the front end, so the front end can use that to upload to S3. Um, you can use S3 pre sign URL, but uh, for things like uploading, I think you want to use a, um, a pre signed post URL instead. So with the post URL, the pre signed post URL, uh, you can control this. You can you can have conditions so that you can limit the size of the upload. With the normal S3 pre signed URL, you can't do that, which means that someone can you know probably launch an attack by uploading uh, 10 gig movies uh, mm. uh, to many, many times so that uh, it's going to blow yeah. up your S3 bucket in terms of cost. Um, so having some limit and, uh, and things like that is going to be quite useful from a security point of view. So I would, uh, I would say, uh, pre-sign post URL and then have some endpoint that the, the, mm. um, the user can call to get a URL that they can use to uh, upload, uh, to post to. Cool. Thanks. Thanks again for your all of your insights. I would lo really love to hear more, but uh, since we are now short on time, I think <laughs> Fabian just run, jumped in. I think we need to uh, jump to the next talk. But thanks again for your okay, guys, amazing enjoy talk. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks. See Ciao. ya. Yeah, thank you very much, Yanshui. I guess there are so many questions. I saw actually a lot of them. I'm, I think we could probably stay here for another half an hour <laughs> to just talk a little bit more about it. Uh, I guess, yeah, um, everyone can find Yanshui um, on LinkedIn, Twitter, um, all the social media channels. You can also check out the, um, the Serverless Summit registration page. Um, there is everything linked. Um, so make sure to follow Yanshui. Thank you very much for this great opening of the of the second day here. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you with us. I hope you can enjoy the, the rest with like a cool drink and maybe from the backstage now, you definitely <laughs> deserved it. <laughs> Cheers guys, enjoy. Okay, bye-bye. Have a good one, see ya.